Good afternoon. Now it's afternoon, but let's imagine we're standing during a dark, clear night on a tall mountain and look at the Milky Way. You immediately will realize that looking at the stars is not just about science, it's sometimes also a spiritual adventure. You start asking questions. And that was what happened to me when I was a kid. I was thinking about the heavens. And that was full of questions, fascination, hope. It led me to do science and also to think about myself and who we are as human beings. What is out there in, in these heavens? Is there a God? Is this universe infinite? If it's not, is there an end to this universe? And if there's an end, what's behind that end? And if that has an end, what is the end thereafter? I couldn't stop asking questions. Now, we've made enormous progress in the last hundred years addressing some of the problems, some of the questions. Science can't answer all our questions, but a few it can. We've learned, for example, that the universe does have a beginning. It's actually not infinite. It had a beginning 13.8 billion years ago, and where all matter and energy came out of a small point, expanding into this marvelous universe that we have today. Space and time started in one point. And there are also weird objects, probably in our universe, where matter can collapse again into a point, and where space and time literally come to an end, and we call them black holes. I forgot actually to start with the star map here to see the beautiful Milky Way uh, that you see in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, to understand how we think about black holes, how we think about space and time, we have to go back to Albert Einstein, who came up with his fascinating theory of general relativity. What he said was that gravity, the force that keeps us on the ground here on Earth, is actually to be understood as a curvature of space and time. Now, imagine you're playing billiard, okay? And you have a big billiard table. Uh, we can't picture space three-dimensionally being curved, but let's picture it two-dimensionally. Okay, you play and the balls will go in straight lines. Now, someone tells you it's actually not a billiard table that you are playing on, it's actually a big trampoline, okay? And then a friend comes in who happens to be a famous and very big sumo wrestler. He walks onto that table and he sits in the center and he'll create a deep funnel. Okay, you play billiard again and what you will see is the balls will actually curve. And if you just shoot in the right direction, they will actually go in circles around this funnel around your friend. And that's how Einstein pictured space, this curvature in space. Now, there was another effect which played a role, and that is the weird property of light. Light is actually the only real yardstick we have for length and time. Light always has the same speed. And you can actually measure time because light is actually a wave. And so if you have a light going through a box, you can actually, with a very precise frequency, you can actually measure how many ticks there are in this box through this wave. Okay? That's in principle how we measure time with very precise frequency and precise waves. Now, you let light go, actually, through this curved space and time. What will happen? It actually has to go through a longer uh, um, space. So actually, it will be stretched. So if you then measure from the outside, look at this wave, it looks like there are actually fewer ticks in the same amount of space. It looks like time is actually going slower. And that's a prediction that if you go to a gravitating body, time will go slower. Now I think, what a crazy idea. Well, actually, Albert Einstein was right, and you use it every day. If you use your cell phone or use your car navigation system, you use the GPS system. We have precise clocks in space, 20,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And what you do, you compare the arrival times of these signals. What you have to take into account is the clocks up there in space go 38 microseconds faster than here on Earth. That doesn't sound like much. It's one second in 70 years. 
But if you would not correct for this, you'd be off by 10 kilometers after one day if you would not take the equations of Albert Einstein into account. So, you know, those of you who have used the car navigation system today to come here would not have been here without Albert Einstein. So appreciate that. Now, you can go even further. You can actually cram more and more space, uh, more and more mass, into the space that you have. You, you, you keep loading the, the, the Earth with more matter. In fact, you have to you know, do it with 600 million times the mass of the Earth. You squeeze into the same uh, size as the Earth. Then the, the funnel of space-time will become deeper and deeper and deeper. And if you try to kick something out of the Earth, it will be harder and harder to throw something away from Earth. It has to go faster and faster. At some point, it would be needing to go so fast that you would have to throw something out with the speed of light. And that, again, Albert Einstein forbid us. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And somehow the, the universe abides by those rules. And so that means once you cross a certain depth in this funnel, nothing, no information, no, no light, no matter is able to go outside of that funnel. And that's what we call the event horizon. And once that has happened, once you've had enough mass, everything will disappear into what we call a black hole. It's a lot of mass, extreme curvature of space and time. And indeed, time seems to come to a halt at this point, because light will be stretched so far that time literally seems to come to a standstill if you look at it from the outside. When you fall in into a black hole, actually, your time will always be the same. It will always be your, your time. Everything else outside will go much faster. So that's the weird effect of relativity. Time is not the same everywhere. And black holes mark the most extreme point. Now, can we see this? Theoretically, we could by shining light at it. Okay, if you shine light at a black hole, then indeed, like these billiard balls, they would be deflected. The light rays would be deflected, go around, curve around the black hole. And uh, sometimes I could even go backwards here because the black hole could take a long space time with it and you actually have to follow the flow of space. But, you know, a lot of the light rays actually end up in the black hole. If you shine a flashlight at a black hole, what you will see is a black hole. That's as simple as that. So you need light, you need a black hole, and you want to see a hole in there. Now, can we see this in real nature? Do they actually exist? Astronomers think and we think they do. This is a picture of a Milky Way. It looks like exactly like our Milky Way. This is Andromeda, our neighbor galaxy. But, you know, we are about here today. Um, and there are billions, hundreds of billions of stars in this Milky Way. There are millions and millions of small black holes, which probably formed out of the explosion of uh, stars. But in the very center, there's a super monster... Uh, duper black hole in this very center where, uh, where many small black holes probably have accumulated. Stars, black holes, neutron stars, gas have all come to the center and have grown these black holes. And almost every galaxy has these supermassive black holes in the very center. And those we see in the fact by that, that we see radio emission, very strong radio emission coming from a lot of, from a very small region. And we see sometimes X-ray emission come from a small region. Or we see near-infrared emissions. That's how we seem to detect them and identify them. And we also see actually stars going very fast around this central point, sometimes 10,000 kilo kilometers per second going around uh, these, these sources. But we have never seen their properties. We have never seen the face of a, the face of a black hole. And that's what we're trying to do now. What we do is actually we simulate black holes, how they look like in, uh, in, 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 in nature in a computer. So what we do is we put the, all the equations of fluid dynamics, of, uh, of relativity, into the computer and essentially do a weather forecast of what happens uh, to gas around a black hole. And that's what you see here. This is one of the recent simulations. You put gas around it and the gas will swirl around the black hole. It will go almost as fast as the speed of light. There will be differential rotation and that differential rotation will actually act as a big blender. You know, so all the gas and, and stars, whatever comes in the vicinity, will be sort of you know, made, turned into a big smoothie by the blender of uh, the differential rotation around a black hole. Their magnetic field stuff will actually shoot out along the rotation axis. And then if you look very careful and you zoom into the very center, you see here what we've called the shadow of the black hole. You don't see a bright region like a sun, you see actually a hole. 
And uh, that's what you want to see. You really want to see the shadow of the black hole. When I did my PhD 25 years ago, almost shockingly long time ago, if I look back, then uh, I was calculating this with pen and paper, essentially. How would a black hole look like and how would you explain the radio emission? And one thing I, I realized was if I would go to high enough radio frequencies, then the emission would all be concentrated around this black hole. It would be like you would have a radiating fog of radio emission surrounding a black hole that you could actually look through. And how would it look like uh, if you had a super telescope? Okay. What you would see is, okay, little blurry half ring or sickle, maybe a full ring depending how the orientation is, with a little hole in there. That would be how our telescope should see the black hole if you could, could image this. Well, if you want to do this, how accurate, how precise do you need to do? You need a telescope that operates at hundreds of gigahertz. Same frequency, if you go to the airport security, you have to stand like this or like that. That's about the frequencies we're using. This technology is only sort of recently becoming available for astrophysics in, on a large uh, scale. And you'd need to be able to use these waves to actually image something that has the size of a mustard seed in New York as seen from Europe. You need to see a little hole on that mustard seed. Okay, you can calculate how large a telescope do I need? I need a telescope the size of the Earth. It's a bit inconvenient, you say, you know, a bit expensive, and uh, maybe inconvenient to have, you know, all the Earth covered by a telescope. Luckily, radio astronomers know a trick how to actually get a telescope that size. They actually take smaller ones. Well, actually, this one is 30 meters, uh, 10 meters, 50 meters. Um, telescope around the world, and what they do is actually, or what we do, we combine them virtually. We record the data actually on hard drives. There are actually 64 gigabit per second data recorded in the last observing run two years ago. Um, or in the last, this year, we actually recorded eight petabyte of data on hard drives. We bring them together. The data is correlated, is actually combined. And out of that, you generate a virtual telescope the size of the Earth that actually has that resolution. It's not perfect. In fact, it's really suboptimal. You'd like to have many more telescopes to do this, but it's a start and it allows you to do actually those images. And we call this the Event Horizon Telescope. And right now, there are 200 scientists around the world who are actually participating in this enterprise. And right now, people have started to look at the very first images that they have produced from this experiment two years ago. Unfortunately, I can't show you them to them. They're still sort of work in progress. Um, they're going to be exciting, I hope. Um, and you'll probably hear more about this in the next couple of uh, months and perhaps year. Now, if you look at this distribution of uh, telescopes, you want to actually have all the world. And we have telescopes in Europe, we have them in America, on the South Pole, but there's not a single telescope in Africa. And so we started a little project um, that we tried to get a radio telescope, a high-frequency radio telescope into Africa as well, to actually round off our global telescope. And so the last two years, I've been often to Namibia, uh, we are trying to put this telescope on this mountain, which is a spectacular mountain out there, because it's the highest mountain in the region you see to the horizon from wherever you look. And when I was standing there and I was wondering whether actually I'm able to pull off that project, and it, you know, I may not be, we have to see, standing up there on this mountain again during daytime and see this beautiful landscape that's out there. Even desert can be beautiful. I thought, you know, it really is worth the effort. At night, you have perhaps the most beautiful sky in Namibia that you can look at, because the center of the Milky Way is right above you. It's completely clear air, dark nights. And looking at the sky there is totally mind-blowing, to be honest. And so the next time you have a chance to actually, especially go to Africa or the Southern Hemisphere, Take the time, look at the Milky Way, which is very well visible there, and marvel about the beauty that is out there. Start to ask yourself these deep questions that will come automatically. Not all of them, science can answer some questions, some of these fundamental questions your heart has to answer. But a few science can, can help you to answer. Is there an end to the universe? Not everything we can see but here we may have the privilege, actually, to eventually look and see 
at the end of space and time. And that's a great privilege to be part of. Thank you.